I'm Alicia Mikolajsik Kurtz, and this is Real Talk. Today's episode is a little different than our other episodes so far. We're releasing it off cycle to line up with next week's annual American College of Emergency Physicians, or ASEP, conference. At ASEP, thousands of people who work in emergency care will come together to learn, network, and plan their work to continue advancing our specialty over the next year. One of those people is an incredible mentor and dear friend of mine, Steve Anderson. Steve is an emergency physician in Seattle. He's a national leader and on the board of directors for ASEP. He knows literally anybody who is anybody in emergency medicine. And yet, he's down to earth, so approachable, and treats everyone he meets with kindness and respect. He's the kind of guy you find in a room full of important people in perfectly pressed business suits. But while he's suited up too, he's never without his Chuck Taylor all-stars his thin rat tail and his silver hair reaching down his back, and his most noticeable accessory. A gigantic, genuine smile that just sparkles with the joy he feels, being part of something bigger than himself. At a live Real Talk session during the Washington ASEP Summit to Sound conference last year, Steve shared an intimately personal story of his experience with a loved one suffering from opioid use disorder. For those non-medical listeners out there, opioids is the medical term for the family of highly addictive drugs related to morphine and fentanyl, oxy, hydrocodone, methadone, heroin. When medicine first brought opioids to the world, we did so thinking they were helping people. Finally, we had medications that we said were safe and effective and we handed them out like candy to anyone with even the most minor complaints of pain. The administrative end of medicine jumped on board this pain-free train and started pushing things like the pain scale. How is your pain from 1 to 10? They started scoring doctors on their ability to alleviate patients' pain, in part basing doctors' payments on how satisfied their patients were with their care, which really just meant directly asking patients, Did your doctor take your pain away? This trained all of us, providers and patients alike, to believe that being in any pain at all is unacceptable, that pain is all bad, that we should do whatever it takes to make all pain go away. Except we were wrong. Opioids aren't always safe. They're addictive and dangerous. And now... They're everywhere. These are the medications patients are asking for by name in our clinics and our hospitals. They're being sold on every major street corner in America. And they're killing people. As in tens of thousands of people in the U.S. every year. Over 120 people every day die from an opioid overdose. Not to mention the thousands more people whose lives are negatively affected by their addiction. When somebody uses opioids for a while, their body becomes literally dependent on the drug just to feel okay, never mind actually being free of pain. It's not just about getting high, it's about not going through the horrific and painful process of withdrawal. But these are not bad people or stupid people or any less of a person people than you or me. They're just normal people. Normal people that made unfortunate choices. Choices that will leave them struggling with addiction forever. But they're still people. They're somebody's sister or brother or child or parent or neighborhood friend. They have dreams and hopes and feelings. They suffer from loneliness and pain. This is not a problem affecting just one specific group. Data shows clearly that it actually affects every community, every culture, every socioeconomic bracket, people of every color and of every creed, everyone. It's the Vietnam War or AIDS epidemic of our time. It affects my family. It affects Steve's family. I know it's affecting many of you too. And we have to work together toward solutions. This 
is Steve's story. So it is such an honor to speak again at Summit to Sound. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, this is going to be the hardest talk that I have ever done, so I'm going to ask you to let me read some of it to get through of it. Maybe the pivotal lecture that I gave at Summit to Sound a decade ago and then went on and gave it at Scientific Assembly was dying to ease the pain. It began to expose the light of the opioid epidemic in America and um, how people were dying and we were part of the problem. And so some of the slides that you're about to see are from this lecture that I've been giving now for 10 years. One of the slides that I show shows an awful lot of people that you will recognize the faces of who have overdosed in the United States. And I don't necessarily think the world is a better place because these people have overdosed and disappeared. But um, the story that you're going to hear a lot woven in now to my story is the beautiful young lady that's on your left, Casey. From an early age, Casey knew that she was obsessed with her own beauty and those around her. Her goal in life was to make others feel great about themselves. In that journey, she, um, count how many different hairstyles and colors you can see, she eventually became a stylist a mile up the road from here on Capitol Hill, very successful. And um, the one thing that was constant with all these hair colors and all these looks was the 32 tooth smile that would light up a room and through reciprocity would bring everybody else's smiles out. She was all about making the world a beautiful place. As a fun-loving, um, stylistic, free spirit, um, maybe one of Casey's signature cuts was her father's rat tail. So if you haven't figured out, Casey was my daughter. Casey is one of two people in the world, two women in the world, that I love to the moon and back. And I'm not sure if it was genetics. Um, she was adopted. I'm not sure if it was the influence of her father that had her rappelling down waterfalls, who had her um, climbing on ropes between mountains. Um, I'm not sure if it was the fact that CenturyLink Field was always louder when Casey was in the house. But Casey lived life to the fullest. And when someone said to her, uh, you know, hey, why don't you try heroin? And um, in Casey's own words, she'll tell you that the very first time heroin touched her lips, within one minute, she knew she was addicted for life. I want you to understand that I love my daughter Casey with all my heart. I love my daughter Casey as fiercely as I hate heroin. Any addict or any loved one or any father of an addict will tell you that it's a roller coaster. You start by wanting to get high, but very soon it's all about not wanting to be low. The same goes for the families. The same goes for the fathers. As Casey went up and down, periods of sobriety, periods of relapsing, um, I've ridden on the same roller coaster. There's hope, there's forgiveness, there's mercy alterating with fear and guilt and regret. You know, you fear the disaster. You fear that the roller coaster is going to blow up, and then you pray for a great day the next day of clean sobriety. And in the downtime, you start to question your own parenting. Um, I've even had people come up to me and ask, where did you go wrong raising Casey that she became a heroin addict? I think about that over and over and over. I was lucky a couple months ago to stumble across an article written by Jerome Adams. Jerome Adams is the Surgeon General of the United States. And uh, Dr. Adams tells his story that his brother's uh, serving a 30-year sentence for the terrible things that he did to feed his addiction. Surgeon General, felon junkie, 
same parents. It's not always about parenting. Heroin is, can trump upbringing, relationships, love, if we let it. So this talk's supposed to be about how this life experience has changed my practice. So I'm going to tell you two stories to start off with. At Auburn, we were the second hospital in the state of Washington to create a naloxone program where you could take home naloxone. Um, we built a pack that cost us 25 or 28 bucks to produce with two ampules of uh, naloxone and a nasal sprayer, and we gave it to people that were at risk. And I can tell you that as proud as I was about that program, it doesn't prepare you for the first time you get the phone call that your daughter's been resuscitated by naloxone. It was police the first time. I'm glad police have it, and it's not locked up only with EMS and only in our Pixis. But the second time, it was with a friend who had gotten the locks on from our program. I can tell you that now every single patient that I see who's got opiate use disorder, while I'm draining their abscess, while I'm talking about their resuscitation with them, um, I offer them naloxone. Casey was resuscitated, and the guy I took care of two nights ago told me he's resuscitated 15 of his friends with the naloxone that he had, and he was glad to take another prescription from me. So we need to offer them ways to get out of that spiral to save their lives so that we can move on to the next step. Maybe the penultimate worst day of my life was 16 months ago. Casey was all lined up to go down to rehab in California. We had a 10 a.m. flight for her to check in at 6 p.m., and it was a cold, rainy, foggy day in Seattle, and if you've ever been in Seattle, you know that meant that the flight got delayed, and the flight got delayed, and 5 o'clock, the flight finally got canceled, and we were rescheduled for the next morning to go on the next flight. So I'm driving Casey home, and Casey says to me, Dad, I can't make it. You gotta let me out of the car. I'm not gonna make it. And so as a dad, I had to drive Casey to her dealer's house, and I had to wait outside in the rain while Casey went upstairs and got hooked up and got high so that she could make it to the flight the next morning, which she did. But I now have an X license. And that night, there was no place to go to get Suboxone or Buprenorphine for her. And so I went the next week and my hospital has now created an MAT program where we can give it in the department and we can have people followed up with the warm handoff. And I'm just gonna tell you uh, that, that nobody should have to miss their window and have to go back to injecting because we haven't taken the time to create an MAT program to salvage them in that window when they're looking for help. But, you know, more important than programs in the emergency department, I'm going to tell you how this has changed me as a person and as a doctor. I've jettisoned all my judgmental attitudes. My ED needs to be a place of healing that folks can come to with disease and they feel welcome. There are good guys and bad guys in this opiate history. Um, I can talk to you about, for hours about body trafficking, which is not sex trafficking. It's moving vulnerable individuals from rehab program to rehab program for profit. This is becoming an industry rehabilitation, and there are heroes and there are dark hats in this too. But it's a vulnerable population, and I want you to know I don't use the word drug seekers anymore. I don't call my COPDers albuterol seekers. I don't call my DKAers insulin seekers. Heroin's a monster. And addiction will make good people do bad things to feed that monster. But addicts aren't evil people all the time. They're people just like us. And they're members of families. They have complicated backgrounds. and. When they find their way to our gurneys to ask for help, we need to help. Unfortunately, when Alicia and I started to write this program and turned in our slides six weeks ago, um, I was going to tell you that Casey was at 90 days clean and sober. 
She was planning on getting her chair back. She was planning on moving home, but she was worried. She said, Dad, you know, every single time I relapse, and I know I'm going to relapse, it's, it's Russian roulette because my tolerance changes and I just don't know what's out there. And on February 18th, Casey OD'd again, and there wasn't anybody there with naloxone. Um, so at her memorial service, I could have had $9,000 of dead flowers, but instead I've got a $9,000 scholarship in Casey's name at a place called Battlefield Addiction Coffee House, which is 100 feet from the front door of my emergency department. Battlefield Addiction's motto is reuniting families, addicts, and the community. So I want to task you all to read the book Dreamland in the next year. It's the 30-year history of the opiate epidemic in the United States. And I can honestly tell you that every single page of my copy has a teardrop on it. Um, the author, Sam Quinones, in his epilogue, at the very end, he tells us that there's no policy, there's no single pill, there's no magic that's going to get us out of this epidemic. What's going to get us out of this epidemic is rebuilding community, removing the stigma around addiction, and inviting our addicts back in with love and with support. And so that's what I do now. I go to Battlefield Addiction for my coffee every day, and when I go to work, I try to do the same, and I'm going to ask you to do the same, because the next person through the door for you might be Casey. And we can save them one life at a time, and I really want to ask you all to devote yourself to that. And I thank you for listening to my story. The opioid epidemic affects all of us. It's a problem the medical community isn't solely responsible for, but we did help create it. Like Steve, there are many powerful stories of people's experiences interfacing with this epidemic. And while many include heartbreaking losses, like Casey, these stories are not over. Hope is not lost. Steve mentioned his passion for being part of the solution, working in naloxone distribution and with buprenorphine, a medicine that helps those suffering from opioid use disorder to get off of opioids for good. Programs like the Bridge Grant here in California are working to make buprenorphine available in every emergency department so that the work doctors like Steve are doing becomes the standard of care in every ER. And there's more. Other movements like ALTO, or Alternatives to Opiates, are helping educate providers on not turning to opioids as the first-line treatment in minor pain. And other groups like the Harm Reduction Coalition have tons of information to help educate healthcare professionals so we can better talk to patients about things like safe and clean injection practices to reduce the transmission of HIV and hepatitis, and making sure our patients have naloxone on hand to be able to reverse overdoses in real time. We need to meet our patients where they are, ready and willing with whatever resources and support they're ready for. But it will take all of us doing all of these steps together to ultimately stop our fellow humans, our families, our friends, our patients from dying from this disease. If you want to be a part of the solution or for more information in general, email us at realtalk at vituity.com or visit the websites of the many organizations that are fighting this fight together, including bridge to treatment.org, harmreduction.org, and cdc.gov slash opioids. A very, very special thanks to Steve Anderson for sharing his story with us, to the entire team at the California Bridge Program and the many other MAT and harm reduction programs that are out there for all the work you're doing to help us fight this epidemic. To the team at Vituity for their support of this podcast, to Marco Gonzalez, our sound engineer, and of course, to all of you for listening. I'm Alicia, and this is Real Talk. <laughs>